name is Viola Llewellyn. I'm the president, the co-founder of Avamba Solutions, Inc. Super excited to be chairing this panel, which is going to be a really interesting conversation about manufacturing on the continent, an area that is often forgotten, but has the biggest impact on all the interrelated industries that we are all looking to invest in, create profit. Don't forget that word, please. We don't just do it for the fun of it. We do it for our continent. We do it to become globalized. So without further ado, we're going to be having a great conversation. And I'm going to ask my friends, my colleagues, my panelists to please come join me when I call your name. Madame Birami Sok, the founder of Quelly. I believe you're here. <laughs> Madame Masogbe Touré. <laughs> Mr. Olu Pitan, the uh, managing director of Bank of Industry of Nigeria. And forgive me, I forgot to tell you, Madame Touré's uh, title. She's the CEO of CETA Group here in Ivory Coast. And we were going to have the pleasure of Mr. Gagan Gupta, CEO of Arise. But unfortunately, he is unable to join us. But I know he sends his regrets and best wishes. And I think at this point, we can dive in for an exciting conversation. And hopefully, there will be some questions and answers at the end. Okay, we're all seated. A few housekeeping rules. Questions at the end, all questions are welcome. If you're gonna ask a question, make sure it's a question and not your own little personal thesis. That is not what this is for and I will cut you off. To my panelists, my friends and colleagues, this is your opportunity to contribute to this topic and we'll start out with some introductions. And I think we'll start, is it working? No. I'm so sorry. This conversation is going to be in French and English. Um, please do use your headsets. Um, I believe they may have been pre-programmed to uh, channel number two. If you have any issues, please do uh, check in with the guys at the front. There are some technicians. But Madame Touré, while you're fixing that, why don't we start with Birame? It's so good to finally meet you. Why don't you please give us an intro about yourself, your company as sure. well? Sure, thank you. Thank you for, the, um, for giving us the opportunity to be here in the introduction. So my name is Biram Sok. I'm from Senegal, and I'm the founder and CEO of Quilly, uh, which is a B2B marketplace uh, for African products. Uh, which is also paralleled with some work that we do with the local suppliers in order to make sure that their products are export ready. Uh, we focus on food and cosmetics for now, um, making sure that we can change the perception that people have of Made in Africa products. And happy to be here. That is wonderful, thank you. Um, what, Mr. Olu, while she's getting ready, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Olu Kayaudi Ekpiton. I'm from Nigeria, the MD CEO of Bank of Industry. Uh, Bank of Industry is the oldest DFI in Nigeria. We are over 60 years old. Uh, basically, <coughs> we, uh, one of the things we do you know, is we transform the industrial sector in Nigeria you know, by providing uh, long-term facilities, you know, yes. working capital with good moratoria at a single-digit interest rates basically to ensure the economic development of the country. So basically your organization greases the wheels for the women and the men who are involved in both the ecosystem in the marketplace and the bottom of the pyramid activities as in uh, what CETA does with cashew. So uh, Madame Touré, are you okay? Ça marche? Oui, ça va. Yeah. Okay. Um, introduction, s'il vous plaît. Oui, je suis Massoubé Touré Diabaté. PDG du groupe CITA. CITA, c'est la société ivoirienne du traitement de NACARD. Alors, nous avons un groupe qui s'occupe de l'agro-industrie avec plusieurs matières premières. Aujourd'hui, nous allons vous parler de la noix de cajou que nous produisons, que nous transformons et que nous exportons. Nous avons 38 années d'expérience. Nous sommes la première usine 
en Afrique de l'Ouest a transformé la noix de cajou. Et nous sommes là ce, cet après-midi pour parler de la transformation et les défis liés à la transformation. Absolutely exciting and thank you. Did everybody catch that? I hope that your translators are working. She's in the cashew sector, but we'll go from there. Um, I know that they've given us a script of the things that we really ought to cover, but for me, manufacturing is incredibly exciting and very important. And right before we came on stage here, I was having a conversation with somebody about how disconnected manufacturing as um, an internal and an external ecosystem is and very fragmentalized, especially in light of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Now, I want to start with yourself, Biram. Mm -hmm. Please, can you tell me, in the industry that you're in, what sort of trends are you seeing that will lead us into some sort of prosperity for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement? Sure. Um, no, I appreciate that question. I mean, it's, I think it's been very interesting to hear all of the different debates that we've had around the um, you know the Africa trade agreement and how it's it's really it, the objectives are very clear I think and everybody understands the objectives uh, the question that's always been asked is to try to understand what's happening up here at the policy level yeah and what's actually happening down there at the execution level what we're finding is that when we talk about industrialization especially when we talk about food mm -hmm. um, and agriculture being the future of Africa, we realize that what we're talking about are small companies, SMEs and sometimes even micro, um, mi micro enterprises, yeah. and mostly led by women who are working in a very artisanal, uh, artisan fashion, I should yes. say. And, and so I think what, um, what we've, I think, realized is that we need to figure out how to bridge that gap so that those that are actually moving a lot of this infrastructure are not necessarily the big guys, um, but they're rather the smaller companies that need to be able to better understand and have the tools necessary to be able to benefit from this amazing policy that's been put in place that should hopefully help us be able to increase exports within Africa. Perfect. Madame Touré, um, uh, did you catch some of this? Because there was in something interesting here about the role of women. When you and I were chatting earlier, you made a very clear distinction between work and enterprise and execution. And I've just heard it here again now. And Mr. Olu, I want you to hold on to this idea because I'm going to be putting you a little bit on notice regarding this. Madame Touré, would you like to tell us about CETA and the role and what you see within manufacturing for women who are at the bottom of the pyramid and what the aspirations are to be much larger and to be bigger players? Merci. Alors, j'ai pour habitude de ne pas accepter que les femmes sont toujours en bas de la pyramide. Ouais. Parce que les femmes ont toujours été ingénieuses et elles ont été toujours à la base de la transformation. Qu'elles soient petites, moyennes ou grandes, elles arrivent toujours à transformer ce qu'elles ont autour d'elles. Et c'est ce que nous avons vu depuis toujours. Le rôle aujourd'hui de la CITA est d'encourager et elle a toujours encouragé Parce qu'au moment que la CITA commençait la noix de cajou, la Côte d'Ivoire n'était même pas sur la liste des pays producteurs de la noix de cajou. Et nous sommes venus, euh, aujourd'hui ça nous fait 38 ans, mais la NACAD n'est pas venue d'ailleurs, la NACAD était ici. Mais à la base, c'était planté pour faire le reboisement. On n'avait pas encore vu le côté économique. Et quand on a vu le côté économique, Et lors d'une mission, je suis revenue dans mon village et j'ai démissionné de mon poste pour me mettre à la disposition de mon village pour pouvoir développer cette culture. Nous avons commencé par 5 hectares avec des femmes, justement, où on a créé une petite coopérative avec 5 hectares. Et après 4 ans, nous avons récolté. Mais ce que nous avons récolté, je n'ai pas vendu un kilo. J'ai fait la distribution gratuite des semences et expliqué le, les techniques de planting aux femmes, okay. au, à ceux qui voulaient s'intéresser. Et aujourd'hui, on peut vous dire que la Côte d'Ivoire est premier producteur mondial avec plus d'un million de tonnes. 
C'est une réussite. Mais nous disons qu'on ne va pas toujours continuer à développer l'économie des autres à notre détriment. Si nous avons cru en cette filière, c'est bien pour avoir le retour sur investissement. Donc, il nous faut passer absolument à la transformation. Et c'est pourquoi, depuis 20 ans, j'ai fait la première usine de traitement de noix de cajou. Et aujourd'hui, je peux vous dire qu'on n'a aucun complexe. Et nous transformons, nous exportons sur le continent, partout dans le monde. Nous exportons aux États-Unis, en Europe, un peu partout. But I think, from the little I did understand of what you're saying, and I'm going to pass this on to you, Mr. Olu. Did you, were you, was the translator working for you? I would very much like you to respond to this from the perspective of the sorts of um, initiatives that you've been driving. I'm pretty sure you've seen some, simil uh, some familiar and similar situations in Nigeria. Would you like to comment? Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting uh, listening to her uh, when she didn't agree that the women are at the bottom of the, of the pyramid. Yeah. Um, I think I agree with her to a large extent. Uh, why? In Africa, most of the businesses are medium, you know, micro, uh, small, medium enterprises. Uh, over 90% of businesses in Africa we fall into that category. Most of those businesses are actually headed by women, you know, uh, because women, are, they can multitask, you know. When they have children, they need to take care of the children. Even when their husband is not working, they cannot afford to have children at home who are not being fed. So one way or the other, they will do one kind of business or the other. But then they normally have a challenge in Africa in raising finance for their businesses because most of the lenders, unfortunately, are men. You, you know? are on dangerous ground. Here. Yeah. You are telling some scary but painful truths, and I congratulate but, but you for that. But that is the truth. Yeah. And they normally require the women to come up with security. Most of the security are held by the men. Yeah. When they have a home, usually it's the husband that has the home and he doesn't want to give that property up as security for a loan to the wife. So they Especially struggle. if the girlfriend needs the house as well. Oh, well. <laughs> That's me being facetious. It's not necessarily true. Dangerous Don't girls. report me to the PC police. Okay. So they have problem raising money. Okay. So what we have done in Bank of Industry, you know, we've realized that fortunately for the women, the MDCEO of Bank of Industry at that time was a woman. So she made sure we had what they call the gender desk, a desk that caters for women. You know, women owned businesses and women managed businesses. We've been doing that for over 12 years now. Okay. And I can tell you that banking women is good business. Women actually pay their loans. You know, uh, the rate of uh, repayment for women is higher than the men, and it's been proven all over the world, you know. Uh, so if you actually bank the women, you know, you are doing good business. You know? So I agree, but things are changing. Yeah. And things have to change some more, you know. There are facilities now that you have, there are power, all of those things that are actually meant for women, you know, to make things work better for them. Uh, but the, if you're looking at the, the whole industrial sector, generally in, in Africa, you know, things are changing. Yes. You know, there are some trends that we are seeing now. Uh, for instance, it's getting more high tech. You know, uh, you're talking of digitalization of businesses. Uh, you're talking of 3D printing. Can I no. ask you a quick question about that? Yeah. Industrialization, which we've seen, we're now in the fourth industrial re uh, revolution for Africa. Mm. And I'm gonna ask you and you the same question. In what you've just talked about, We've quickly arrived in, in the area of gender, mm. and you've brought in the next best thing, which is digitalization. Mm. In your opinion, accelerating the role of women through this continuum, is this a policy or an execution issue? Because Biram brought that up, and I want to get your feedback and yours as well, but can you address that very quickly? Well, uh, maybe both. 
Okay. Because most of the businesses run by the women are small businesses. Mm. They are not usually the businesses that make use of these modern tools. But these modern tools are important if you want to scale up. You know? So it's also a matter of the education of the women, the, the girl education. You know, if somebody has four or five children in Africa, generally, they yeah. probably spend more money training the, the young boy than training the, the, the girl, you know, but that has to change. It certainly does. Let me stop you there. Policy or execution in light of what Olu is talking about here and your personal experiences? Um, my experience is all about execution. Uh, as an entrepreneur, we know that you only make it when you are able to execute. And, uh, you know, the interesting part for me when we talk about manufacturing and industrialization, especially within the context of Africa, is when, when I wanted to start, I was actually looking at Alibaba. And I was cool. just like, how can we build an Alibaba for Africa? But then very quickly realizing Alibaba was, was organizing a sector that was already industrial. Um, that was their strong point. In Africa, maybe our assets are different. Mm. We do not yet have that industrial sector. Do we have to build it exactly the same way other people have? We don't. Do we have to build it just around those that do big things, which would be majority men, or do we have to build it thinking right from the start about the SME and the woman and anybody else that doesn't necessarily have the same profile that people are used to seeing? Um, and I think we have a big opportunity to start from scratch and build something that Africa actually owns and that's specific to Africa. And I believe that having the, the free trade agreement really helps be able to think about that from that perspective. But now we have to follow and not just try to duplicate what's going on somewhere else, but build specific to our, our context. And so to me, I think that's the biggest challenge. It's figuring out how to execute, because when you talk about execution, it's about t making sure you're dealing with the reality. Yeah. And that reality is different. And so the way we execute just needs to change. Reality and execution. Madame Touré, you gave me a beautifully packaged bo uh, bag of cashews. Thank you so much. Agoa, all of these things being globalized and the fact that we eat with our eyes, even within manufacturing, whether it's a chair or a bag of cashews. Can you please share with us your journey to understanding what it takes within the manufacturing industry to make African products look and feel acceptable globally? Did, uh, uh, vous comprenez la question? Merci. Okay. Alors, je peux dire que les produits africains sont déjà acceptés. Il ne faut pas qu'on se mette des esprits, des barrières inutiles pour rien. On n'a pas de complexe. Okay. On a du capital humain, on a de l'expertise africaine. Il faut qu'on se fasse confiance et qu'on croit en ce qu'on fait. Aujourd'hui, on parle de la ZLECAF. C'est très bien. C'est une très bonne chose. La seule chose qui handicape l'exécution sur le terrain, c'est la logistique. Il faut qu'on arrive à circuler librement. Il faut qu'on arrive à circuler facilement et à la portée de tous. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, circuler dans notre zone est un peu plus cher. Et du coup, ça entrave la circulation des produits et tout ce que nous transformons. La chance n'est pas ailleurs. Et je pense qu'en tant qu'industriel, je ne dis pas, bon, tout à l'heure, mon voisin m'a dit que euh, avec les femmes, c'est les petites entreprises, mm. etc. Je ne suis pas d'accord. Moi, j'ai cinq enfants, j'ai élevé mes enfants et j'ai travaillé et à la plantation, j'ai fait mon usine et on continue de travailler. Et ces enfants-là, aujourd'hui, continuent aussi de travailler avec nous. Ce qu'on voulait faire comprendre, L'industrialisation de l'Afrique ne se fera pas sans les femmes entrepreneurs. Et c'est les femmes qui sont au devant de l'industrialisation. Yeah. Parce que c'est elles qui ont l'idée, la patience, la vision de pouvoir transformer nos matières premières, quelle que soit la quantité produite. Et ça, c'est extrêmement important. Et nous ne pourrons pas arriver vraiment à l'industrialisation tant souhaitée par l'ensemble des acteurs, 
l'Afrique ne peut pas s'industrialiser si on met d'autres franges à côté ou bien qu'on se dise que mais cette frange, c'est juste des petites entreprises, il ne peut pas grandir. Je, je pense qu'on doit grandir ensemble. On doit évoluer ensemble. On doit investir dans l'industrie. L'Afrique doit s'industrialiser. Ça a été dit depuis hier, mais ça a été dit il y a plusieurs années avec le président de la BAD à Dessina. Et il a dit qu'il fallait qu'on arrive à arrêter d'informalité, de, de, de et, 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 comme on appelle ça, les préjugés, et d'aller immédiatement à l'industrialisation. Parce que ça se prie qu'on va pouvoir bouter de notre espace la pauvreté et ça se titre qu'on va pouvoir créer des emplois et des opportunités et des activités génératrices de revenus. Aujourd'hui, quels sont les défis Qu'est-ce que nous demandons Aujourd'hui, il n'y a que quatre choses, de mon point de vue. Le premier, c'est quoi Le premier, c'est avoir la matière première, la, la matière première en abondance et en qualité. Si nous avons la matière première, deuxièmement, il faut avoir le process. Et le process, c'est de maîtriser son activité. Le process, c'est d'avoir le bon équipement pour pouvoir faire la transformation. Le process, c'est aussi la digitalisation. Le process, c'est de savoir comment il faut maîtriser la chaîne de valeur du début jusqu'à la fin. Une fois on maîtrise euh, 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 le process, Troisièmement, c'est le marché. Il faut avoir des débouchés. Parce qu'il ne faut pas produire avant de savoir comment je vais évacuer. Donc, il faut avoir le marché. Et pour moi, le quatrième point, c'est le financement. Merci. En Afrique, aujourd'hui, il y, y a des pays africains qui sont très en avance. Il y en a qui sont au milieu, il y en a qui commencent. Mais il y a certains qui ont déjà atteint leur seuil pratiquement en termes de production de matières premières. On ne peut pas être premier partout en tant que pro premier producteur ou bien premier exportateur mondial. Ce n'est pas un titre qui nous honore en tant qu'Africains. Transformons nos matières premières sur place. Créons la richesse. Créons les opportunités. Beaucoup de valeur. Beaucoup de valeur oui. ajoutée. Et ça se titre que l'Afrique va pouvoir Pardon, Madame se Pire, I, 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 I can Absolument. Feel the energy building here. Hold on to that because I would like to put you on the spot one more time and either of you can respond to this. Bank of industry. One of the things that we all know, especially those of us who are involved in digital transformation in other sectors, when it comes to sit down with policymakers and banks, there is usually a lag time between an innovation and policy, those races do not run parallel. And Madame Touré has mentioned what I think are five things, not four. Quality, process, equipment, digitalization, and finance. Banks are not designed to create wealth. At least that is my personal opinion. But the bank of industry, even by its name, seems to have a title and a mandate that might allow them to push a little bit further because without these five items that Madame Touré mentioned, we continue to see what we have today. Do you want to address what the bank does internally in order to scale up and finance and fund anything to, regarding digitalization, transformation? Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hold now, that energy, the please. Bank of Industry, like I said, you know, we are DFI, Development Finance Institution, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the things that she spoke about, you know, were the reasons a bank like BOI was set up. Uh, what do we do? In the last, maybe from 2015 to date, we must have, uh, I think, given out in terms of loans, about 3.5 billion US dollars. What the so, default rates like? Default rate for Bank of Industry, well, if I want to answer you directly, you know, uh, I would say non-performing loan is less than 5%. Mm. You know? and, but then I can further break that one down to say what is the default rate for those who are in micro. I want to hear this. Micro is very high because that is the most risky segment of the market. Mm -hmm. But we do more lending 
to large enterprises than to the micros. So let well, me see if I've got this straight. Hmm. Micro, highly volatile, yeah. but very lucrative. Yeah. Difficult to measure risk, difficult to control. Do you guys view yourselves mostly as an asset-backed lender, or are you just doing straight traditional loans? No. Uh, okay, when you say it's very profitable, yeah. for small firms, for the fintechs, they charge the micros much higher. Oh, I of the see. Risk. We okay. don't do that. In Bank of Industry, you know, most of our loans, you know, are single-digit loans. If you look at a country like Nigeria, mm. where inflation is about 20%, and we are lending money at 10% and below, between 8 and 10%, that means that the funds that we give out are actually subsidized, which means they must go to the sectors that the government also wants to encourage. The good part about Bank of Industry is that policy and implementation, you know, they come together in Bank of Industry because we are owned by government. You know, the majority shareholding of the Bank of Industry is Ministry of Finance and Central Bank of Nigeria. You know, so we do that. Like I said in the last five, years. Are you years, sure that you guys aren't too far high up to be able to see some of these, the stories being shared by your co-panelists? Oh, yes. We, we, you see, there are many ways we do that. One, we have platforms. We also okay. use a lot of fintech. For most of the people in the micro, you know, we use a lot of technology to disburse funds to them. Otherwise, the cost you know, will not make any sense to us because we're not charging that extra to make a lot of money. Also, we work through the commercial banks and the microfinance banks to actually reach these micros, to lend to them, because they are much nearer to them. You know, we don't have that many number of branches. In the whole country, about 30 branches. Okay. But there are commercial banks with 2,000 branches, 3,000 branches. So we use them for the bottom of the pyramid. But we do reach out to everyone. Uh, and she was talking about the, the access to finance. The type of things we do also, the, the loans that the commercial banks might not want to give because it's very risky. We de-risk it. For instance, in the creative industry, you know, when you ask somebody who is a, a film producer, what do you have as security? All they have is the copyright to the work that they have done. Mm. So we have to figure out a way that we can finance that film production using what they had produced. And we, just, and we do that. So most of the films that you watch, you know, coming out of Nigeria. Did uh, you say films? Oh, yes, films. You, Nollywood. Nollywood. We are active in Did Nollywood. not see that coming. OK. Oh, yes, we do that uh, because a lot of people are actually employed in that sector. You know, oh. you have people that uh, do the decorations, uh, people that do the costumes, uh, uh, the people that on the, work on the cameras, you know, the, the venues that they use, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole ecosystem. And we're very active in it, you know. Uh, Can I give, Biram, I felt the energy rising in response, and I know that having exited a company and you've been strongly involved in manufacturing, how do you react to that, especially in light of having raised money yourself? Yeah, I mean, um, no, I think, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect. Not necessarily, you know, in Senegal we do have the equivalent maybe of, which is called the DER, which, um, which is a government arm that, that funds um, women and youth, in, in, and they do microloans as well as they do equity deals. Um, where I see the disconnect is, you know, with Quilly, what we've done is that we said we were going to start focusing on access to market, so the distribution, creating that market, creating that demand at the international level. What we realized very quickly is that the demand is there, that there's a lot of sponsoring to get these um, local, you know, producers to go to different shows, to go meet with potential clients, et cetera, maybe with, um, with cashew nuts or baobab or any other products that, that, we, that we may have. But what happens is the sale doesn't happen. Mm. And the sale doesn't happen because usually they're asking very high volumes. And this supplier is quite small. And so what, they, what happens is not only are they small, but also their products don't meet certain standards. 
And to be able to meet those standards, you need to be able to understand them, but also have the resources to be able to, to do the work that's necessary, to have access to packaging. When we talk about industrialization, I always laugh. I say, we all have to buy our packaging out in China, in Turkey, in the United States, but not in Africa. Yeah. Why? Why haven't we started with that part, which will actually help with exports? So really, we have primary, secondary, and tertiary markets yes. that are all investable, all interconnected, yes. that we don't know how to connect to create an entire continuum for small business to grow along in order for us to also use these sorts of modern methodologies to create uniformity, which brings me to another topic. I hate to cut yeah, you off. Yeah, yeah. If anybody has seen, and this is me shamelessly plugging myself, I have a series of very ridiculous videos that I do on Facebook called, uh, where I have called myself Africa's official unofficial minister of stairs and standards. Why? Manufacturing is done best when there is uniformity of standard. If you go to my beloved country, Cameroon, and walk down a pair of stairs, you are going to suffer vertigo before you actually fall down. That's because the stairs are not built to code. Manufacturing in Africa is about to go through hell on earth, people, if we don't have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement working on digitized standardization across all assets across all products. I'm gonna throw this out to you guys and feel free to mention the green economy if you need to. Who wants to start? How are we going to maintain the value and protect the profits and the growth of our industry? And what's the best way to approach standardization for the African continental free trade zone? I'll just sit here. I'll wait. I, I wanna take it. <laughs> and just because it's a, oh, it, it, it is. An audience? If you've got something to say about this, we will open it up for comments at the end. So please. Um, standards is something that I'm quite passionate about just because um, I remember my last company was actually in the United States and the idea was to build a digital receipts platform. And what I realized very quickly is that if we were going to be able to capture data from point of sale from different retailers, we were gonna need a standard. And the first place I was able to go to was the National Retail Federation, because they actually had a particular division which was called the Association for Retail Standards, Technology Standards. And there we were able to develop a standard for digital receipts, which today is still being used by most point of sale um, manufacturers, by all of the data, um, data analysis companies or data analytic companies, et cetera. And so I think what it is, is just a matter of building an African retail standards body. Yes. And building that body and studying the different areas of it, not necessarily just e-commerce, but looking at it from a textile perspective. How do we identify sizes from a food perspective? Today, what we do is that we base all our food standards uh, nutritional facts based on the FDA standards. Because oh. we don't know what other standards to go by. So if I go to the States and ask them about Iguzi, Gary, and Okra, they don't have the numbers according to us. They have what they've done. That's correct. Okay. And certain products, they probably do not even have the English name the for The proper it. standards yes, for it because it is products that are not yet available there. And so I believe that there's an, there's an important part that's missing to this whole ecosystem and that we just have to break it into different pieces mm -hmm. and just work through them as a continent, not that's necessarily right. just in each country. Yeah, I'm hoping that you caught this. I would love to hear your thoughts. Maram has brought up points that are very dear to my heart. I'm so sorry to cut you off. Uh, I would love to get your response. Standards. D'accord. Uh, je pense que pour ce qui concerne les normes, on ne peut pas euh, standardiser les normes de plusieurs matières. Je pense que la normalisation peut se faire par filière. Et quand on fait la normalisation par, la, par filière, on a plus de chances de pouvoir s'agrandir et mieux même exporter. Et c'est ce que nous avons fait ici en Côte d'Ivoire, avec euh, même la noix de cajou, on est en train de voir et on travaille là-dessus 
pour voir comment effectivement on peut avoir une noix et une norme ivoirienne dédiée à la noix de cajou Côte d'Ivoire. Okay. Donc voilà. Donc on essaie de faire des normes à ce niveau. Et on a aussi euh, un bureau d'études, un bureau de normalisation qu'on appelle Codinorm, mais qui fait la normalisation de l'ensemble des produits. Et quand un producteur ou bien une filière a un produit comme ça, peut venir pour pouvoir faire la norme. Maintenant, une chose, c'est de normaliser dans son pays et harmoniser. Mais une autre chose, c'est de savoir est-ce que cette norme est reconnue à l'international. Donc ça aussi, c'est une autre barre de manche. Pour Mais moi, il faut une organisation et voir les petits producteurs, comme on dit tout à l'heure, les Italiens et autres, les accompagner à grandir. Parce que plus il en aura, mieux ça voudra. Parce que les petits détaillants ou bien le petit producteur ne doit pas mourir petit producteur, à mon sens. doit effectivement avancer, progresser dans son activité, à la limite devenir un semi-industriel et rattaché à une grande industrie qui va lui permettre de pouvoir évacuer son produit avec des standards qui va respecter et à partir de cette chaîne de valeur, on peut aller jusqu'à l'international. Parce que le tout n'est pas de produit. On va produire, il faut qu'on transforme. Quand on va transformer, il faut qu'on arrive à évacuer. Donc, ah. sur quel marché C'est vrai, nous avons le marché local. Nous avons le marché local. Mais il faut, en plus du marché local, il faut voir à l'international le marché local pour deux produits, parce que avec le riz, par exemple, nous devions produire le riz. And there should be no difference between the two, whether it's for local consumption or for exporting, right? Donc, local, comme à l'exportation. Sure. Voilà. Mr. Olu, I, I'm yeah. pretty sure you've got some amazing experience in this area and some comments. Yeah, thank you very much. What you just mentioned about standards is very, very important. Yes because Africa is losing a lot of money by not meeting standards. Now, the other problem that we have is the colonial background. Some African countries, you know, had British background, some have French background, some have Portuguese background. Some of these countries have different standards. So if you now Which make, ones in particular, or should we be more polite? Which is why, <laughs> That's where I'm going. Okay. That the same pragmatism that made African heads of states to come together and sign the African Free Trade Agreement must be used when it comes to standards. Like she said, there must be a body yes. set up to harmonize these standards. You know, otherwise, the person from Nigeria cannot sell in Ivory Coast. Exactly. And then you have to look at the standards between Africa and Europe. Mm -hmm. So don't also lower the standards for Africa because it means we're going to limit the market to Africa. Even though we are talking of a market of 1.2, 1.3 billion people. Yep. Business to business, you know, projections about uh, 660 billion US dollars in 2030. But that can only happen if this problem is solved. And you should look Maybe that body should look at the areas where this, because if EU can do it, yeah. EU, there's so many countries, we can learn from EU. You know, there are some standards that they have over the years. They have many years of experience. They've been able to put together. I think this is going to become an issue of um, tougher IP protection for African uh, innovation, which is an industry of itself, and a body, as you mentioned, that is a combination of normal individuals along with the government. I think that the market forces of entrepreneurism and business has a huge role to play here, partnering together with the government, not in the old fashioned PPPs, and it's got to be on a digital platform, and it has to be constantly revised, and it has to be fast at changing, responsing, responding to change, because the manufacturing sector 
as it improves and gets better, actually develops faster, especially for those products and asset classes that are aimed at consumerism and products that are used by the everyday person. Once you get into commercial, big-scale manufacturing, that's a whole different ball game. But this entire continuum requires standards and interoperability. Otherwise, we're going to be looking at digital poverty tomorrow and a new scream and hue and cry over the role of colonialism that just can't seem to remove its claws from our backs. And it needs to stop. Sorry if that upsets anyone, but we are talking about an industrial revolution that involves self-determination and autonomy within the space of creating from Africa's raw materials, which leads us to the next slightly scandalous topic. We stand on majority of the world's wealth yet we're somewhat poor in comparison, if you, and depending on what kind of a yardstick you use, and we mentioned women, and the fact that we're often closest to where the physical activity is, and often there is an atrophy of our numbers the closer we get to industrialization and mechanization. I'm gonna start with you, Madame Touré. What, uh, have you seen this in your experience and how do you think we can resolve this going into the future? And I need short answers because we're running down. Repetir la question ou quoi? C'est clair? Okay, I was saying that the role of women in the bottom of the so-called pyramid has us very physically involved in labor with very little revenue appreciation for our efforts. And the further up you go on the industrial chart to where we're now mechanized and exporting finished goods, there are fewer women there. What do you recommend that we can do? Because this is another area of financial inclusion that is really important for our future. Merci. Sure. Merci. Euh, mon souhait ici, c'est de ne pas laisser ces braves dames en cours du chemin, parce que elles ont osé entreprendre. Elles ont eu l'audace de créer une activité génératrice de revenus. Mm. Donc, elles ont prouvé ce qu'elles avaient. Il leur suffit simplement de venir donner un petit coup de main pour qu'elles puissent exploser. Donc, au jour d'aujourd'hui, ce que je demande, c'est peut-être un plaidoyer, c'est de pouvoir investir sur ces femmes, c'est pouvoir investir dans les activités de ces femmes qui font les mini-industries, parce que c'est elles, aujourd'hui, qui nourrissent la nation, parce qu'elles ont la capacité de transformer. J'ai une plateforme où nous sommes près de 500 femmes, c'est continental, hein? il y a l'Afrique du Nord, l'Afrique du Sud. Tout le monde est dans cette, sur cette plateforme. Mais c'est des femmes qui sont dans l'industrie, dans yeah. la petite industrie. Elles transforment tout ce qui se produit. Mais elles ont des idées géniales. Job creation, elles ne demandent employment. seulement qu'à les soutenir, qu'à les accompagner, qu'à les financer pour qu'elles puissent montrer le meilleur d'elles-mêmes et pour voir comment éventuellement on peut grandir ensemble. Je ne voudrais pas que ces femmes restent Au stade primitif, vous dites que non, elles sont petites, elles vont rester petites. Il faut naître, il faut grandir, il faut qu'on brille ensemble. Et c'est ça, une Afrique émergente. Yes. Did you want to add anything? Um, I think for me, the biggest thing, when people ask me to even describe what we do, the one sentence that I like to go back to is changing the perception. Mm. Changing the perception, to me, is changing perception of Africa, changing the perception of African products, it, changing the perception of what an African business looks like. It's just changing perceptions. And the only way to do that, and maybe it's, it's, it's my sort of way of looking at it from an American you know, point of view, is, is to say it's all about marketing. And we talked about all of this and never talked about marketing. I know. Right? Yeah. And, and, and we tend to forget oh, actually, about marketing. In I think Monsieur Olu sort of touched on it when he talked yeah. about Nollywood. But yeah, yeah right. exactly. But, but we need to be able to promote better what we do. 
who is doing it, how they're doing it, what our products are. The one example I will give just to, to, to close out on this is, I always say, when did we forget that shea butter comes from Africa? We used to say, my mother's generation, my grandmother's generation, they used to like to go and buy imported products rather than going to the market to buy the shea butter that was available, 100% natural I and organic. I have never gone into an African woman's bathroom without seeing an Avon product back in the Thank day. You. you make a really great point. And now, it's the, it, it, at some point, it became the thing. Shea butter was the thing. We find it everywhere. We forget that it's from Africa. Next thing, it was the argan oil. Is that African too? It's from Morocco. Morocco, of course. Right? Yeah. They call it the Moroccan argan oil. When are we going to make sure that all of these products that are now to come, especially on the agricultural side, the baobab, the tulukuna, the neem, all of these products that carry moringa. such... Moringa. They carry such amazing nutritional value that the whole world is hungry for because it's simple food but it's natural food when are we going to just own it from the production to the transformation to the distribution and be proud to say this comes from us you know you're talking my language and guys jump in things that we may not know about africa apparently the world's biggest supplier of lab rats is in Ethio is from ethiopia there is no such thing as Italian leather. It comes from over here. Sweden, Switzerland, they don't grow cocoa, but we do like to talk about Belgian cocoa and, and coffee and, and chocolate. There is a misnomer and a requirement to disrupt the narrative around how things are named because it's really important. And just as we're wrapping up so that there's space, I would like to ask you, Mr. Olu, real quick, when you hope for the best for our continent from manufacturing, what three things do you believe will be absolutely imperative for us to make it to be the biggest global trading zone ever? Thank you. That's a lot of uh, questions in one. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. Uh, you see, manufacturing in Africa, you know, the, the prospects are huge. When you look at the figures now, you know, manufacturing in Africa uh, is about 12% of GDP, okay. which is low. Uh, when you look at figures from AFDB about how much, you know, we require to put into manufacturing, you know, uh, in terms of the funding gap in Africa, uh, you're talking between 68 billion to 100 billion annually. So there's a big gap. But then you now get into the issue of this, uh, uh, the green manufacturing. Mm. Africa is so far behind. You know, uh, our emission, you know, is about 3%. But at the same time, you're saying we should cut it down to, to zero. We should work towards zero. You know, there was a study done by McKenzie, you know, of what Africa requires to have zero emission in the next 30 years, the figure is uh, $2 trillion next 30 years. Where's the money going to come from? I don't even know. So Africans, you know, we need to, to do what we have to do. The funds that we are looking at to come from the West, you know, I'm not sure <clears throat> that one is going to come in. And they're also the ones telling us to be zero, correct? To be to be zero emissions? Well, we should work towards it. We should, because actually we only contribute 3%, but the effects of it are also felt in Africa. The flooding, the drought, the, the things that we see that are happening. Yes, so I would say Africa needs to put in money. So the three things are capital? Capital, uh, do what you have to do. For now, By we need any to expand. means necessary. Yeah, we need okay. to expand, you know, so we can produce what we need. Growth. You know, and focus on the needs of Africa. Food sufficiency. Yeah. You know, part of the problems that we have, all this uh, crisis that we have, we don't produce enough food. We spend our money importing food at the very minimum. Africa must be able to feed itself. Madame Touré, the three things are very important for the future of Africa. 
dans le secteur de manufacturing. Did I say that correctly? Yeah? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I even forgot this one. D'accord. OK, ton français était correct. <laughs> Alors, trois mots pour que l'Afrique puisse s'industrialiser. Premièrement, il faut que l'Afrique se donne les moyens de pouvoir avoir de l'eau, de se donner de l'eau. L'eau, extrêmement de importante. De l'eau. Oui, de l'eau. Yeah. Yeah. Parce que quand on va maîtriser l'eau, on va produire du riz. Quand on va produire du riz, on pourra transformer yes. et on aura l'autosuffisance mm -hmm. alimentaire. Mm -hmm. Deuxièmement, il faut que l'Afrique arrive à se mettre ensemble. Quand je dis l'Afrique, l'ensemble des acteurs, il y a les politiques, il y a les partenaires au développement et les industriels, les acteurs, le secteur privé, qu'on puisse s'asseoir pour se parler, se parler franchement, parce qu'on sait où se trouve le nœud. Beaucoup a été fait, mais beaucoup reste à faire. Mais personne ne le fera à notre place. L'Afrique regorge un capital humain extrêmement important, intelligent. Faites-nous confiance. Il faut qu'on se fasse confiance, qu'on se parle et qu'on se dise, qu'on se parle en face pour voir quel est le problème. On le sait, ce n'est pas l'argent qui manque, ce n'est pas le projet qui manque. Alors pourquoi on n'est pas industriel So the three simple things that she mentioned were water salination, voilà. I didn't catch the other two properly. Um, water salination. Ils n'ont pas. And I think you mentioned, was that... Je, oui, oui, je, pour l'industrialisation de l'Afrique. Oh. L'industrialisation de l'Afrique. Standardization. Il faut que les partenaires au développement, l'État, okay. le secteur privé, on puisse converger dans le même sens. Parce que ce n'est pas les ressources qui manquent en Afrique. Ce n'est pas l'expertise aussi qui manque également. Mais pourquoi nous n'arrivons pas J'ai dit tout à l'heure qu'il y avait quatre aspects. <rire> okay. Et ces quatre aspects, aujourd'hui nous parlons des financements. Tous les bailleurs sont là, sont présents. Mais qu'est-ce qu'il faut Les trois choses qui bloquent l'industrialisation, c'est la matière première. Pour cette matière première, on a atteint déjà l'objectif. Il y en a où on n'a pas atteint. Où on n'a pas atteint l'objectif, essayer de renforcer la capacité de production pour qu'on puisse passer à l'industrialisation. So if Mais I were to summarize you, because we're running out of time, voilà. we're talking about uh, water, energy, sanitation, desalination, yeah. um, Et private sector partnership. L'énergie, yeah. de stockage, yeah. de stockage, de digitalisation. Mm -hmm. Voilà autant de, de freins aujourd'hui que nous avons oh, pour qu'on puisse mm -hmm. aller à l'industrialisation. Et okay. c'est ce que j'avais résumé dans les quatre points. Parce qu'il nous faut le stockage, il faut la numérisation, la digitalisation. Digitalisation. Voilà, qui n'est pas un luxe aujourd'hui. OK. Voilà. And our lightning round of the three things that you believe are required? Uh, I, I believe, as I mentioned, the common st standardization sure. uh, across Africa. I would say having a common vision Everybody working in terms of the same priorities and having that common vision. And the last one is, also, is more a context-based investments. Oh. So rather than investing in the big, what we believe to be what we call industrialization today, looking at the context of each of these sectors, the context of who is doing what and investing based on those particular needs. There's one thing we haven't asked, what should we avoid investing in? Mr. Olu, and this is real quick because we've got to open it up. Uh, ammunition, we should stop fighting. I love that. Uh, and anything really that is going to hurt the environment. You yes. Know, even though uh, we are not talking of zero now, mm -hmm. but we should begin to prepare towards it. Yeah. That's the way the world is going. Madame Touré, what should we not invest in or stop investing in? On, va, on doit arrêter nos investissements, comme il a dit dans les armes. I'm sorry, on I doit investir in, in on doit investir. Oh, okay. On doit investir dans le capital humain. Oh, en Afrique, of course. Le capital humain. Human capital. Voilà. L'éducation, la formation. And that's what we need to continue investing in. Exactly. Okay. What about yourself? Right. Right. 
a bit controversial, but less investing less in politics. Okay. And 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 that is where you know we see in military arms and things like that. It's important, but investing less in 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 politics and more I love in that. people. Any questions from our very kind and loyal audience? Does anybody have any comments, questions, or complaints? Can't quite see. You do? Sit up. I think somebody stood up. There. Yeah. If somebody stood up, please do hand them a microphone. Nobody? All right. In summary, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I have personally found it incredibly invigorating. It's not my original primary focus, but I don't think that any practitioner in our space or our industry can avoid coming into contact with what it means to build not just the manufacturing sector, but secondary industries attached to manufacturing. For example, when are we going to stop buying doors from overseas when we grow wood? When are we going to have homemade tires when all the rubber in the world is here? When are we going to have a secondary market for refurbished tires? And at what point will refrigerated transportation take its rightful place and save us from ourselves? And I would love to see comprehensive rail service end to end, north to south, east to west. For the African Continental Free Trade Agreement to work, we also need to change our educational curriculum. We are not all cut out to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, nurses, and teachers. There is a vocational requirement to invest in the lives of the young, and there's also an incredible imperative to make huge investment in the creative arts. The creative arts are the wrapping around the hard structures that we create. Things have to look and feel good. Africans deserve to enjoy what we make and the beauty of it. Think about this, guys. We heard mention of Nollywood. We don't have a film school. Cameroon itself, right there in the massive port, I don't know anywhere where they are teaching logistics at a world-class level for people from the outside to come in on our ground, in our playground, and to learn from us. If you look at the Caribbean, wonderful examples. The US Virgin Islands has one of the best marine biology uh, institutions. Everybody in the rest of the Caribbean goes right there. We need a network, people, to connect the people, places, and things that drive the profit. And we need the banking and finance uh, solutions, both long, medium, and short term, to support that. I know we talk a lot about women, but please, people, you can't get here without us. We need to invest in women so that they can raise good sons with the industrial mindset that we all seem to have at such an organic level that we don't even know how to talk about it sometime. I really enjoyed gracing this stage. I love Ivory Coast. You guys are a shining example. And I'm glad that since 2018, we had a little hiatus, but we're back now. There are so many different sectors that manufacturing hits. Don't even get me started on pharmaceuticals or the fact that we need to change our legal framework for both IP protection and the interoperability to make sure that we are fully connected I want to thank everyone who was here today, both online and in presence, and please give a round of applause for our excellent panelists. It was a pleasure to serve with you all. So thank you all. We're all available on LinkedIn, and we're all available for partnership. True or false? Very true. All righty. Thank you all. Merci.